Thank you so much, Bob. Thank you so much, Tony. My name is Maury Haber. I'm the CTO and CISO for Beyond Trust, and I'll be asking as your host and moderator today. I want to thank Thomas very much up front for joining us today for this a day in the life of a CISO and this interview. Uh, Tomas, we have a wide variety of people that join these programs, and many of them are engineers, some still in college, many of them are not even in cybersecurity, and they're interested to know what it's like from your perspective, my perspective, what it's like to be an executive in a CISO role. So first off, can you tell me a little bit about yourself and uh, what you do? Sure. So... Uh... Um, one, uh, good evening, everyone, or wherever you are in the world. Uh, good evening, good afternoon, good morning. Uh, thank you for you know joining this event, and thank you for sort of uh, taking the time out of your evening to sort of uh, and your day to listen to, to what I have to say. So I'm very honored, and, and I feel uh, humbled by that. Um, look, my uh, my my backstory, or, or what I'll call my my origin story, just because I want to sound like a superhero there, Maury. Is uh, you know I'm I'm just a, I'm just a simple simple man a, a simple boy who grew up in New York City, uh, you know I'm I'm uh, background I'm I'm Latino I'm Puerto Rican, uh, grew up in New York City spent majority of my life uh, in New York uh, in the New York City school system, uh, went to Fordham University learned about computers found a fascination with computers uh, very early on I, I think of when I was maybe around uh, second or third grade where I remember having a sort of Apple computer in, in school and, and making it move and draw lines, you know, sort of found that fascinating, right? And so fast forward that to me doing computer science in college and sort of the internet starting to evolve and, and, and you know, take shape, if you will. Little did I know that I would continue to find that fascinating and not only fascinating to the point of how to make computers uh, interconnect, but also, you know, how to, how to break into computers, right? And how to uh, sort of uh, do uh, potentially bad things to computers and then ultimately figure out how to secure that. So, you know, I, I'm very, uh, um, I, I say, I always say I started from very humble beginnings. Um, you know, parents uh, put, Put instilled in me uh, not only confidence, but uh, they were very stern in, in my upbringing. Uh, growing up in in, in New York City uh, with my dad, a federal post officer, and uh, and my mom, uh, you know, a very stern administrative assistant, uh, keeping us, uh, myself, and my sister on the straight and narrow. So uh, that that's me in a nutshell. I've obviously been doing uh, cybersecurity for over twenty. Well, 23 years, um, I think over 23 years now. So I might, I, sometimes I feel like a dinosaur, but uh, other times I've, I run into people that have been doing it longer than me. So I feel like the young buck in the room. So it's always something new to learn, uh, but I've been doing this for a long time, spent a lot of time in financial service, services around 17 years or so of my career, uh, really growing up in that sort of regulated industry, leading security programs, had an opportunity to sort of be the CISO for a line of business while I was at Chase. Uh, ventured into chemical manufacturing where I started and, and created a new security program for the a publicly traded company who's gone on to do pretty big things uh, in that of international flavors and fragrances. And now I'm at the NFL. You know, I'm, I, I, some might say I'm living the dream. Some might say it's a dream job. Uh, I, I say it's a very great opportunity that I'm very happy and fortunate to have. Uh, I'm, I'm proud to be a, a, an employee of the NFL and I'm proud to protect the shield and, and protect everything that, that we represent at the NFL. Uh, you know, you can almost equate the NFL with being America's game and, and being a, sort of that symbolism of America or an American. And so, you know, I, I, I recognize that. I recognize the importance of the role and, uh, and I don't take it lightly. And so, I'm, you know, that, that's me. That's, that's what I got to offer more. Hopefully that was, that was what you were Perfect. That's what I'm looking for. And one of the things that I find when speaking with a variety of people as a fellow CISO is they always think that we're in an ivory tower, that we're unapproachable. And that's the farthest thing from the truth. Those are some of the things that we want to talk about today as to how to break down those barriers and for people to realize we're just people too. And we just have a little bit different job with maybe some more experience. But to break down that barrier, let's start with something a little personal. What is your favorite sport? Uh, okay, that's a give me, but go ahead. <laughs> well, I mean, I, if, if I if I didn't say football, I'd have a problem. So, uh, so more, yeah, it's football. Absolutely, it is football. No, uh, look, I I like a lot of sports, right? Uh, I, I will be very transparent and honest. My favorite sport growing up was basketball, right? I was I played basketball, 
Uh, I also played baseball. Uh, as I had a, uh, I have an 18 year old son now, so you know he was he was playing soccer, so I enjoyed soccer a lot. And I, now that I'm at the NFL, I'm starting to get back into my sort of football roots. So I, I do like football a lot more these days. So. I kind of hedged on that answer, but you know, <laughs> no, it's perfect. It, it's just to let people know that we are humans as well. And, you know, we do have favorite drinks. We do have favorite pastimes, but we don't live and breathe security every day, but we actually might. I mean, one of the things I learned that uh, someone never told me about becoming a CISO is it's true. We lose a lot of sleep uh, sometimes, but if you could think about your own career and your own life, what is one thing that you wish you had known before you started your career as a CISO that was a surprise to you now? You know, there's, there's two things. One is I didn't know that it would be fun, so much fun, right? And, and I know that might sound weird and odd, but if you're really doing this job, right? And, and, and this job being either a security practitioner coming up to your career or, you know, at the top of your career as a, as a CISO beyond, you really need to enjoy what you do. And I truly enjoy doing the job of a security professional. Uh, I truly enjoy that aspect of it. And I really didn't know that it would be actually that much fun being in a room with, you know, Roger Goodell or, or other senior leaders and talking around security and, and helping them understand how security can help enable the business. So that, that's probably one thing that I, that I would say. On the flip side of that, I also didn't know it was going to be distressful. So I'm not going to sugarcoat it. The job is tough, right? And you really need to want to do it uh, because, you know, at any given point in time of the day, you could be on the chopping block, right? Something could happen and you could be, you know, if, if you're at a company, you could be the scapegoat of the company, you know, for better or worse, you, you, you know that, right? Um, yep. if you had a, and that's usually the companies that don't sort of uh, fully appreciate the role. If you're at other companies, um, it's just stressful because of all of the challenges that you're dealing with. And I would say for us at the league, it's, it's really stressful because of the challenges that we're dealing with, right? Everybody wants a piece of, of, of the action or, or want to um, cause some level of disruption. And so, you know, trying to keep, uh, keep all those attackers at bay is a, is a very stressful job. So to so your comment around, you know, uh, lack of sleep, you know, I, I'd say jokingly to, to quote one of the sisters that I know, you know, joking, I sleep like a baby, right? I wake up every two to three hours every night because I can't, you know, because I can't sleep. You know, I'm, I'm stressed uh, with, with uh, making sure that we're protecting all the doors, you know? Well, it is kind of true. They, the statistic is the average CISO lasts for a year and a half. Um, I've been doing it for over two now, so I've already broken the back of the bell curve. You know, if you're not having fun in a job, it's not the right job for you. And with that comes success and failures. It's true. To help everyone understand, yeah, it is stressful, it is sleep, but it is quite rewarding, especially when you get something really strong uh, done or something majorly accomplished. You got to learn from your failures, just like losing in a sport. What is one of the biggest failures you had that really made you step back and learn from it to, to be a better person? I'll say one of the things that sort of uh, uh, a failure that I had that sort of defined uh, my trajectory in, in security and really sort of rooted me in my understanding of security was very early on. I, I worked at Goldman Sachs. So this was around maybe, I don't know, I don't know the time period, but I was there for 11 years from 2000 to 2011. It was early on in my sort of Goldman Sachs career where we were working on IP telephony. So I'm going to I'm not gonna to get too technical here, but we we're working on IP telephony. If you remember that sort of time period, you know, Cisco and all these other vendors had their sort of IP telephony or, or the concept of, of voice over IP. And I think we were in that phase of, is it IPT or is it voice over IP? We have no idea, but you know, how do we wanna market this? And where I'm going with this is, you know, I was junior level in my career. I was a risk manager at Goldman, really technical, understood the ins and outs of, of IPT and how to break it and how to hack it and how to secure it. And I get into this meeting with, uh, with the business stakeholders who were also technology people. And I'm starting to push forward all these recommendations around, you know, we should encrypt the communication. We need to make sure that there's no, no VLAN hopping. You know, we need to have end-to-end -end encryption. All of these things that were really good ideas that I thought were great ideas, right? I'm coming in junior whippersnapper, you know, I, I could break it. This is how you secure it. And I go through my spiel and, they, and, and I was sort of humbled because the, 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 the senior leader at the time, one, I didn't appreciate the, the feedback that I got. So I'm gonna be very transparent. You know, growing up, 
New York City kid growing up, it's hard to take sort of rough feedback. Um, but I was professional. I heard the feedback. It was it was to the point where if we would have implemented all the controls that I pushed forward, we would have not had a solution that would have worked. The phone would have never actually made a phone call, which is what it was supposed to be able to do, right? Yes, it was going to use the IP to let IP network and do all of those things. But that sort of um, that that experience was humbling for me. It was very tough to deal with the feedback. Um, I thought it was borderline unprofessional of the person giving me the feedback, but it gave me the, you know, the piece that I took away from that was you, you need to one, always come in and listen to your audience, listen to the other person on, across the table from you to understand what they're trying to accomplish so that you can then figure out what's the risk and how do we secure that, right? So leave your agenda behind. I didn't do that. I came in with my agenda. This is how we're going to solve this problem. And the other thing that I, that I thought was, that I learned from that was security, you know, if you, if, you, if you run your security functional program, and again, I wasn't running a program back then, but I still keep this to this day. If you're running a security program in a binary state of one of zero or one, it's either on or off, you're not thinking about it in the context of how is the business going to continue to be profitable or how is the business going to leverage this technology to enable them to, to accomplish a task. And so you're not that business enabler. If you're not that business enabler and you're not thinking about risk management, you're not going to be seen as an as a ally to your counterparts at, across the table, and you're not going to be invited into the room and to be in, uh, be in the room to have those decisions where you want to be in uh, to, to sort of continue to, to, uh, to grow, right? Grow not only career-wise, but grow uh, from a business standpoint. So that was uh, very humbling. Uh, one of the things that I learned from that, uh, it was, uh, you know, it, it wasn't my, in my opinion, it was my biggest failure. I don't have anything, I've been lucky. I haven't made a lot of mistakes with my career, you know, uh, which is good. But that was one that I, I can definitely point to that helped me understand the value of thinking as a risk manager versus a security person that says no all the time. You know, one of my peers actually said to me as a CISO, one of the biggest things we have to learn is to sit down, excuse the expression, shut up and listen to everybody else and then make the decision. They don't want to hear us talk. They want to bring us things. You came from a Goldman Sachs financial all the way to the NFL. What's the difference with doing security or being a CISO or a risk manager between the two, especially when it comes to listening? What is the, the biggest thing that you've had to discern between the two different verticals? Well, look, I, I think the biggest thing, uh, at least for me, and so, you know, I went from, from financial services to chemical manufacturing to NFL, so three completely different industries, right? And the biggest thing for me was to map and align um, sort of the, the, the same, the similar principles around understanding the business, understanding what we're protecting and why we're protecting it and understanding what are our business drivers? How do we make money essentially, right? Because I work for capitalists, you know, for companies that are profitable companies, how do we continue to generate revenue? Um, I've been able to, to successfully identify those three things and then align it to everything that I sort of know around fin of where, where I worked at at financial services, where I spent the majority of my career, right? I, I, I always point to that background because it's a highly regulated environment. If you've ever worked in finance, you know that you're regulated by several, you have several regulators, you have internal auditors, external auditors, you have a lot of eyes on, on the prize, which is essentially protecting the, the economical fabric of, of, the, of, the, of the business. Um, so what I always try to do is I try to understand my business, understand what will work in terms of controls to protect the information. And then I try to size up the, the organization, not only from a technology standpoint, so where we are in our maturity, uh, in terms of things like technology debt and, and hygiene and all the sort of bits and bytes of mapping it to like your standard frameworks, but also where are we from a maturity level across the organization from a, from a business and a leadership level, right? Do they understand security? Do they understand the difference between cybersecurity and information security, right? Are those, are those concepts foreign to them? Uh, do they understand the three lines of defense and how do we play into that sort of mindset? And the reason I try to gauge that is because that will help me understand how much education and awareness I need to do at that senior level, uh, leadership level to help them understand when I go and present different topics to them, help them understand why I'm 
asking for things like budget or resources or, or new initiatives, uh, but also be able to piece together a, a plan that'll, that'll help us hopefully uh, um, end up maturing over time. So that's usually what I, what I, what I do and, and how I sort of accomplish it. All right, so we had a couple of really sharp questions come in and I'm gonna weave them in real quick. What are the three lines of defense that you referenced? So the three lines of defense is you, you have that sort of first line of defense, which is really that control owner, that control executor, if you will. So if you think about it in the context of, of most financial services companies or even in general, you have like IT, right? Who are, the, who are the individuals when you think about a policy of like eight characters in length, you know, uppercase, lowercase, who's implementing that control? That, that control owner is that sort of first line executor. That, that's, the, that's that sort of first line of defense. So that's typically an IT function. It could be a CISO, depending upon where you are within an organization. It could be a CISO uh, function if you have things like um, privilege access management or the likes. That second line of defense is that sort of risk management, that governance and oversight function, right? That's where a lot of the CISOs, especially like myself, like to sit because that's where we have conversations around, well, what's the risk, right? We're doing less of the sort of executing and implementing controls, but we're doing more of that sort of risk management conversation around what we should or shouldn't be doing. Uh, I say it depends where you are within an organization because some CISOs have first line and they do second line. Mm -hmm. I, I, do, I do that at the NFL. Uh, at the financial services is set up differently. And then that third line of defense within that construct is audit, right? That independent body, that could be audit, that could be a regulator, but it's that third, it's, it's typically an, an audit function, uh, which is doing that third line of defense. And, and the way you sort of think about it is, you have the first line, which is implementing the, the actual controls. They're taking that, that sort of a guidance from that sort of second line of defense, where they're also doing that checks and balance. And then the third line is essentially watching the second line, which is watching the first line. That's the way I sort of simplify it and think about it. And that and helps that a ton, ton for people to understand people. that when we think of this from the business perspective, we have to think of the business first, the controls and the way we manage things, and then who gets you know, the appropriate, the appropriate functions to do. So when we're defending something like a financial organization, obviously you're trying to protect against a threat actor stealing money. What are some of the threats that you would think or that you deal with as the CISO for the NFL, I mean, are they the same ransomware malware threats or are they unique that target your business and uh, the, the teams that would be basically franchises underneath you? Right, and thanks for bringing that back. I realized I didn't answer the other part of that question uh, earlier. So look, at the league, we, we're a company just like any other company, right? We generate revenue, so we have an accounts payable, accounts receivable, we have a sort of P&L, right? A general ledger, things like that. Uh, we have a, we have employees where we have to pay. So we have a, a HR departments. Um, we have obviously lawyers. We have data, a lot of data around personal information. If you've ever signed up for fantasy football and, and the likes, we're collecting a lot of that, that information. So from a corporate standpoint, we have very similar data attributes that any other company would have, right? That, that manages employees, that manages relationships with contractors and, and, and vendors and the likes. Um, so it's, it's not a lot of difference there. Um, where we get into some of the nuances is we actually have some, um, you know, information around medical information. We might have more medical information or, or, or we might uh, um, engage with, uh, interact with more medical information around, you know, health and safety and things like that. Uh, so that might be different than like a, like, like a, a different institution. Um, do, we deal with very similar threats because the threats are, one, they're very prevalent. So things like phishing threats and the likes, wire transfer scams, you know, business email compromise, those are all very similar threats that any organization would face, and we face that as well, right? So at the league, the league is essentially, a, you know, you can think of it as like a holding company where the 32 clubs essentially uh, manage and, uh, or sorry, the 32 clubs sort of feed into and manage the league, and then the league provides services back to the clubs. And the very simplistic way to think about it is that the clubs pay league fees and those league fees provide them services, right? So the league will provide services back to the clubs. And those services could be things like negotiating contracts, things like services that my team might provide to those clubs. So there is some level of interaction in terms of data flow that we do come across. Uh, we, we obviously have separate uh, entities, uh, the clubs being separate entities from the league. And so there is that level, level of separation in terms of data that we might 
um, come into, into contact with. Um, and the systems are set up adequately to protect and, and maintain those levels of separation of not only duties, but separation of, of, of legal entities and responsibilities around the actual data set. Um, but we suffer from the same types of attacks that you would uh, see. Some come more often than others. Things, uh, uh, when the season is on, we see a lot more of the jiggling of the handles of cyber attackers trying to break in and you know, profile, do their reconnaissance on the network, trying to figure out and find their point of entry. Um, we see phishing emails just like any other company would see. Um, more times than not, different times of the year, we see more types of attacks uh, along the lines of, of um, yeah, standard social security numbers and things like that around phishing, right? If you think about tax season. Um, and then when, when we shift into our main tentpole events like Super Bowl or draft or any of these other events, you see more uh, attempts on like trying to disrupt services. Um, so that might be more uh, for more focus on, on sports and entertainment versus uh, other, other um, industries. But those are the type of attackers. It's, it's, not, a, it's not different. Look, attackers are very opportunistic. And it's a game of numbers for them. So they, you know, they're flooding us the same way they're flooding uh, the rest of the world. I will say that, you know, if I compare it to financial services, where in financial services we would get like, you know, trillions of attacks every millisecond of the day, our levels of attack are not at that trillion levels of attacks on a millisecond, but we do get billions of attacks on a on a monthly basis. So it's, uh, you know, people know who we are and they know what they want to try to attack. You are a high profile target. I mean, if a threat actor or named group could do something or do something that was public, obviously like a bank or any other profiled organization, it, it would be potentially devastating. Let's take gear, take the gears back a little bit. We talked first about your failure, what's unique about the NFL, how it branches out. You have attacks like everybody else. What is your biggest accomplishment, whether at the NFL or in other parts of your career? Well, I'll say personally, my biggest accomplishment is my son, my 18 year old son. That's probably the biggest. But uh, um, you know, very proud of my proud of my 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 boy. Um, look, in my career, I, you know, I I I would say that I've been very fortunate to sort of have several accomplishments throughout my career, right? And I I thought before leaving my last role, you know, my biggest accomplishment was sort of creating a security program, literally from scratch, from the ground up, clean slate. You know, we started off with with literally nothing, and we ended up with a with a fully functional and somewhat mature program uh, when I left four and a half years later. But coming to the NFL, you know, we pulled off an NFL draft last year that was a virtual draft, and you know, I I almost have to hang my hat on that as being my biggest accomplishment to date because we not only pivoted to doing uh, from a physical to a virtual draft, uh, we pulled it off. Uh, there was Vegas odds. You know, I don't know many CISOs that have to go into work with Vegas odds against them, saying that the, you know there's there's some prop bet that the that the draft is going to get uh, there's going to be a cyber breach on the draft. You know, I, I I didn't know whether to place a bet or you know and 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 uh, place a bet on on like the on like the Thursday because on Friday I'm uh, sorry on Monday we were either, I was either going to be out of a job but very rich or or be or, or lose the bet and, and still have a job and and I'm joking around the betting side we don't actually uh, there's no betting you know NFL employees are not allowed to bet on anything anything at all which is a, which is a good thing integrity of the game is optimal um but look, the, I, I would say that's probably one of the biggest ach accomplishments that I've had, uh, being able to 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 sort of uh, create and gather the right level of talent to be able to secure an NFL draft, a virtual draft at a time period when it was probably most needed for, I would say, within the U.S. at least, but maybe arguably across the globe with everyone sort of working or having some sort of situation at home. Uh, think about the time period when the draft happened. There was a lot of social injustice causes that were sort of, um, you know, taking hold and grass around, the, you know, the, the U.S. specifically, but you know, more broadly globally. Um, you know, it was a very tough time period, right? That April time period of 2020. You know, pandemic had just sort of got into full swing in the U.S. We went into lockdown. There was no big event happening and. You know, we put on a you know a very a very uh, good showing, um, and we were able to sort of make it 
cyber safe, right? Fend off all the attackers and, you know, pun intended, do a lot of blocking and tackling and keep those attackers at bay. And they, they tried, trust me, they, they sure did try. Well, it's an, well, interesting, it's an interesting concept, concept because, because if your if biggest accomplishment you had to deal with in the last 12 months with COVID and doing a virtual draft event, you probably have to make dozens of other changes due to COVID and the uniqueness of your business because you're used to being in a stadium and helping a franchise doing this. So the adaptability of your position required a lot of thought, a lot of creativity, a lot of support from other people. When you try to give advice to someone that goes, wow, you accomplished all this or you did that, what's the best thing that you could give as advice to someone that wants to pursue a career like this or learn from the challenges that you've overcome with a major distraction like COVID? Well, look, I think the, the biggest thing that I would say is you need to be a continuous learner, right? It, it, you know, I, I can't stress that enough. And, and I know it might be an overused term, but it's, it's the truth. So when COVID hit, you know, I was, I and, and, and others, you know, were looking at how can we understand things like were like the CDC guidelines and the CDC protocols and, and what do we need to do to sort of um, be able to, to get back into performing, right? And, and, and performing meaning putting on the, the season and how are we going to enable, you know, enable the NFL to be able to put forward a, a, a full season with these new guidelines. And so I, you know, I took, I took a uh, John Hopkins class via Coursera, which was on contact tracing and, and trying to give me a, some more insight into COVID, the sort of incubation period of COVID, how long does it sort of uh, develop for so that we could start to do things like evaluating technology to help us do contact tracing at the league, which you've seen the athletes use uh, because we used it uh, to be able to trace uh, inf uh, sort of infection rate and what was sort of pockets of, of, of how um, some of the players were getting sick. And so a lot of the, a lot of the, the, the work that myself and others on my team did to continuously learn and evolve with the time period uh, allowed us to evaluate technologies from different vendors, uh, apply everything that we already knew from a cyber standpoint, now overlay the sort of pandemic and CDC controls, um, but also look at things like uh, applications. If you notice, if, if, if anyone has been back into an office or, or uh, works for a major company, you're probably having to fill out these sort of CDC um, questions on some sort of application uh, uh, app, right? Whether it's a phone app or, or a web-based app where it's, you know, it's asking you basic questions like, have you traveled anywhere? Have you come into contact with anyone, right? We were evaluating technology solutions and working with vendors uh, and work very closely to stand up that particular application. And again, we had to learn and continuously evolve throughout the season based upon how the guidelines were changing. So my biggest advice, piece of advice is you need to be a continuous learner. You need to be adaptable and agile for the environment. And you need to really understand where the business is going. And the only way you can do that is by keeping your pulse and having that seat at the table with your business stakeholders. And the way you accomplish that is by what, what uh, Maury said early on, which is listen more and shut up, right? Listen more as to where the business is going. Keep your, keep your comments and your thoughts until you're able to sort of add some value. Um, and then you'll be able to, to continue to adapt uh, accordingly for your business. So, you know, CISOs that have been successful this year, and, and I, I like to think that I've been somewhat successful this year, or I say this year, I should say prior, you know, pandemic year, uh, it's all a blur, right? I think we're still in March of 2020, uh, who knows? Um, I think the six, they've been successful because they've been able to adapt and help their businesses adapt accordingly. And I apologize if everyone's hearing an echo from my voice. Uh, we're trying to sort that out in the back end. Tomas, as yeah, we try to help people get to what they're ultimately capable of or promoting them or, or guiding them to being the best security professionals possible, how did you recognize or how did you get support to break into your first role of management? So there's a few things, right? It, it, actually, there's, there's two key things. One is a mentor and two is a champion and they're, and they're different, right? Um, or a champion or a sponsor, if you will, right? They're different. Um, and and I, it, they could be the same person, but to me, they're, you, you know, they could be different. And for me, it was different for me in my career. So I had, a, I had some really good sponsors 
you know, when I moved, uh, um, when I took on the, the role when I was at J.P. Morgan Chase, I had some really good sort of um, advocates for me. And those sponsors were advocates, right? So people that are going to speak about you or for you when you're not in the room. And, and, and I have really good leaders there that not only saw the value that I brought to the table, but the value that I had for the organization. And they were sort of my advocates and my sponsors. And then I had really good mentors, not only at, you know, I, I, I don't usually call them formal mentors. I have a lot of informal mentors. So these are trusted either colleagues, peers of mine, or more senior level people, or even junior level people, you know, that, that keep me grounded and keep me sort of in touch with where I need to be from a career standpoint. Junior level people keep me grounded and in touch with what's the latest and greatest that's coming out there. As a CISO, I need to, I need to understand that. I need to, I need to know about things like NFTs, right? Non-fungible tokens and the crypto blockchain world, right? Yeah. I need to, I need to, you know, it's very relevant. It's very, it's very relevant, not only for what we're trying to accomplish, but in this time period. So you need to keep tabs on that. I also need to keep tabs on, on my, you know, colleagues, right? That are, that are, might be peers of mine um, because that's where you foster great conversation and then senior level talent uh, or senior level leadership that are good uh, sort of role models and those sort of mentors to help me understand where I want to get to in my career and help me model uh, my behavior to sort of mimic or take things that work for them so that I can shape the destiny of my journey. Um, so that, that's my advice on, on that. And, and I, it's been helpful for me um, and hopefully uh, others can follow suit. Mentors and champions are critical. Uh, I can at least say for my organization, we, we have a formal mentor or mentee program, and it has been so good to promote people. Many of your organizations may have it, and you may not even be aware of it. It's worth actually asking your HR or any of your leaders if they do, because when it is a formal program, it gives you structure with leadership guidelines. Um, just like doing these series of uh, day in a life, uh, day in of, CISOs, life of CISOs, we're helping, we're helping communicate our knowledge to a next generation. generation. Bob, Tom, Tomas, if you could give a shout out to maybe, maybe one, of one of the most influential, influential people, people in getting your career to where to it is where today, who would that be? Well, look, I, 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 at risk of, of, of not naming a lot of people. If it doesn't have a name or just a title or a person, if they, you don't want to go they, to. They, no, I, look, I, I, I there's, there's a few key CISOs that I've worked for and I've been very fortunate. So if you look at the time period, I don't need to name their names, you'll know. I worked at Goldman Sachs for 11 years, from 2000 to 2011. You, you know who the CISO was for Goldman Sachs during that time period. Mm -hmm. That was probably one of the, the best CISOs that I've worked for in my career and I learned a lot from that person. I then went over to JP Morgan Chase and I worked from, from 20, uh, 2011 to 2015 for, for uh, two really good CISOs who, who, helped, me, who helped shape my career uh, and help uh, and, and uh, opened up doors for me uh, to to be a line of business CISO, right? And and you know when I say a line of business CISO, my line of business is fifty five thousand people. You know for corporate tech, corporate sector of J P Morgan Chase, that's bigger than some small companies out there. Um, but you know th those those CISOs, you know during that time period, you know really sort of help instill in me not only the, the, the fact that I, I needed to, the, the confidence that I needed, you know, I, I remember a time period where I was making, I was pivoting, right? I was at that point of time where I was deciding what I should stay, you know, as a, as a business aligned CISO or, or go and do a global CISO function somewhere else. And, you know, I remember the CISO at the time told me, look, they're like, you got it, just go do it. What, wh why are you, why is this even a conversation? You, you know what you need to do, you know how to do it, you execute very well, go do it. You, you don't need it, you don't have anything to prove to anyone else, go do it. You, you, you got the skills, you're ready. And you know, sometimes you need that little bit of a, of a oomph to sort of, yeah, to, 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 to get out of your comfort zone. And for me, it, it, it worked, right? It, it worked. I had those really good, uh, sort of, uh, uh, role models, if you will, or, or CISO uh, leaders that, that I looked up to. Having a good supporting structure is key, just like being a parent. Um, providing you that guidance, that help, cradling you a little bit, but actually pushing you out of the nest. If you could take one common, one common myth, myth about our profession, profession as a CISO, as a CISO or, even or even a security, even a security professional, professional that people commonly state or misrepresent, or misrepresent something, something that you want to you debunk. debunk. What is what something, something that people mainly think about our jobs? Like we hack all the time or we could break into a computer at will. What is something that you would debunk about being a CISO? So uh, this might sound too simplistic, but 
I, I think people think that is hard. And the reason why I, I say that is because if you really think like somebody that is trying to do something bad, right? Everybody grew up in a, let's say in a house, right? You, if you were to think about your house and figure out how could somebody get into my house, right? Or if you had a car, how could somebody get into my car? What do I need to do to apply protections and controls to mitigate that particular risk, if you will, that threat? Um, you know, it's not very hard if you can put your mind into, into that sort of perspective or look at it from that perspective of how to actually do damage or cause damage or, or steal or rob or something to that extent. If you can think like an attacker, like a bad guy that has a motivation to get after something and that's something you need to figure out for your company, whatever those crown jewels is, it's not hard what we do. The hard part that, that I think we stumble with as security practitioners is explaining and deconstructing all the complexity that we have to interact with and know from a technology standpoint to people that don't do what we do. And if we could simplify it for them, they could, you know, it's not a, it's not hard. It, it won't be seen or perceived as hard. It will be, it will be perceived as something very complex, but very much doable. And I think when we think about it from that perspective, and you think about the sort of shortage of talent that we see coming up through the ranks, coming into this field, you can start to deconstruct that because now you start to say, well, it's not really hard. I just need to find my lane, right? If I'm a, if I'm a technical writer or communications major, maybe I'll be really good at doing security awareness and training. I found my lane. Right. If I'm a if I'm a computer uh, an application developer or somebody that loves to hammer away at a at a keyboard all day, maybe application security, right, or hacking or, or red teaming is that journey is my lane. So it's not it's not hard. You just need to try to associate it to things that you already know and do every single day. You walk across the street, you look right, you look left, you're doing risk management. You're making sure that a car is not going to hit you before you cross the street. It's not, it's not rocket science, it's rocket science. It's just, you need to try to adapt what we do in everyday life to what you would accomplish on a computer. Now, I know people are probably listening and saying, Tomas, it is hard. I know I've been doing it for over 20 years. I get it, I get it. I Trust me, I get it. There are some levels of complexity. I, I didn't, this didn't just happen overnight. I was very hands-on. I used to hack into machines, but you have to, you have, to have that curious mindset of an attacker. And if you have that curious mindset of an attacker, you can de deconstruct it, simplify it, and then you can figure out how do you get the complexities to secure it and you can explain it to people. That communicate the communication skills is probably the probably number one number thing one. to take away. Tomas, we have a ton of questions right. in the Q&A right. and I'm gonna start running through some of them. Uh, okay. The first one that really struck my mind and it's actually been mentioned several times is I'm fresh out of college how do I find the right job? And let's go back for a second and answer that with, you got to find something that makes you happy because if you're not happy with your job, it ain't going to work for you. So what would you give as best recommendations for someone fresh out of school? So I, I can tell you from my own personal experience, having, got, having received several rejection letters uh, and, and I used to keep, you know, this is when they used to send you letters, right? When I was looking for a job out of school, I used to keep a, a, um, a shoebox. My mom told me to keep a shoebox with all the rejection letters. And I re the reason I kept that was to, to one, so that way when I actually did make it, I could look back and, and see that I didn't let any of these rejection letters actually stop me on my journey. But the feedback that I would give is if you don't know what you want to do fresh out of college or you don't know what your path or your journey is, maybe take a help desk role, right? Do an IT support help desk role or even a, a, a security operations level role where you're dealing with that sort of first level analyst um, um, type of a, of a function. Because what you're going to figure out very quickly is, and my path was doing IT help desk for Bloomberg. Uh, what I figured out very quickly was I didn't like doing the help desk. I learned, I knew a lot about technology. True. I hated having to answer the phone and I hated having to, to figure, to, to sort of work through that. And I realized that I enjoyed doing networking much more. And I moved my, I moved my butt out of the help desk into a network, uh, an, into a networking role, which then led me on my journey to do network security. And I always say I stumbled into security. So if you don't know what you want to do, 
hopefully you've gathered enough skill set that you could transfer that into something that's tangible, like a, a, a first level help desk or first level security analyst. And that'll help you navigate through your career. If it's security, do the analyst route for SOC. You'll learn very quickly after like maybe a month that you either love it or you don't love it and you can figure out and buy yourself time to find a different path in life. So as a security professional, another question, and I'm paraphrasing the question, is how do you get the business, the CFO, the board, your manager on board with the information security initiatives that you believe you need to drive? And you mentioned your biggest failure before. So how did you correct? How do you educate and convince people we need to do something? Right. So there's a few a few techniques that I that I use. And one, I say, I, I typically start with creating inf uh, an information security steering committee that's made up of representatives from across the business. Uh, I do that for, for a few reasons. One, that provides the governance structure on the security program and on me, and it allows me to get a, a, a sort of line of sight into where the business is going for their respective uh, areas. Um, that helps me then shape the security program to align to, to mitigating the risk that we identify in their respective areas. So that way, when I go to ask for money for, let's say, you know, I, well, I go to ask for money for a new initiative, I can associate that initiative to a business, to an overall arching business initiative that's either going to be uh, tagged to the bottom line or the top line growth. And that'll be a, a relatively easier conversation to, to obtain the right level of funding and resources. Uh, the other way is try to, un if you understand your, your, your business function, then you should understand the threat landscape and what are the threats that, that you're facing. Uh, you should always have, at least in your back pocket, um, you know, what are the threats that the particular initiative you're trying to, to execute on, what are the threats that that's going to reduce? And then how does that actually, again, tie back to the, the enabling the business to be, again, growing that top line growth or, or hitting that bottom line numbers? So one of the other questions that's tied to it that came across was there's a lot of regulatory frameworks out there, a lot. And when you're dealing with risk and budgets, et cetera, the mappings are not always as transparent or simple. And your organization not only works within the United States, you're now dealing with international, especially when you bring uh, games across country lines. How do you how do you meld or work together with all the regulatory frameworks, especially the new state ones introducing privacy laws? So I try to, uh, with my security program, I try to, um, again, being very fortunate at working so many years in financial services, I try to, to mold my security program to be compliant as if we were regulated by a financial services regulator. And what I, the reason why I do that is if we're meeting a financial services regulator, it almost doesn't matter what other regulations might pop up, whether it's state, local, or, or global in nature, because financial services is highly regulated environment. And more times than not, you're, you're going to be in compliance with any of those other regulations. The other thing that I would say is when you think about security and what you're implementing, if you focus on the fundamentals, right? You have your asset management, you have your application inventory, you have your, your patching, your hygiene, your data security controls, your, your onboarding and offboarding of, of access, or so your access control and your access governance. If you're doing all of those things correctly and you're protecting data and transit and at rest, chances are any new regulation is going to be, you're going to be in compliance with because you already started with those fundamental pieces. So it might be overwhelming and it might seem overwhelming, the latest and greatest regulations that might come out, uh, come down the pipe, um, I can completely see and appreciate that, um, especially if you've not worked in a highly regulated industry. Um, you, you know, there's, there's no short of it. You need to learn. You need to learn and read what are those regulations. But if you if you have worked in a highly regulated industry, keep carry that forward into any other industry that you worked in, and chances are you'll be you'll be in compliance or on the right path of being compliant. A regulator is always going to find something, so your job is to minimize the impact of that. It, it's a great point. So I got one more question, and it's a little bit of a curveball. Um, Dr. Eric Cole, who you, you might know, um, there's a question that came across that says CISOs don't have to be technical, they have to be strategic. 
And I actually agree with that. You have to be very logical, thought provoking, answer the right questions, and then determine the answers. What are your thoughts on that? Well, I, I don't, I'm not going to say that I agree or disagree, um, only because based, you know, if I look at my journey, I started off very technical and now I'm more strategic. So um, in contextualizing that, I think there is and there are benefits to being strategic so that you can align at a, at a leadership level. But there's no, you, you almost can't shortchange, maybe not shortchange is not the right word, but if you're, if you're a CISO who's not technical, you need to, you have two options. One, you either become technical so that you can manage and understand the space and the team that you, that, that work for you, and you can help them sort of move the sort of the bar forward in terms of maturity and where they want to go, uh, where you need them to go, right? Or you hire a good technical person to be your deputy and manage that team and you manage upwards, right? So, I'm fortunate that I think I'm still technical, even though my team might disagree with me at times, but uh, you, I'm not the one that you want to put in front of a keyboard and make a firewall change. That's not me, but I've had to learn more about the strategic side and the business side to, to supplement and, and in some, some instances complement my technical ability. And so for me, I, you know, what I found very useful for me has been leveraging a lot of my technical skills so that when I am in a senior level meeting, you know, I can go as deep as they want to go, but also pull it back up and bring and keep it at that business level uh, to speak the same terminology that they're used to understanding. So I don't disagree with it. I don't agree with it fully, but I think it's just based on my background. I think it's a combination of the two. Um, healthy blend. Yeah, I think you need a healthy blend, healthy or blend. just compensate, right? If you're not technical, yeah. hire somebody that is, right? There's not there's n- so. Uh, Again, I, I work for really smart CISOs. And I learned a lot. And one of the good ones that I worked for, you know, always said, maximize your strength and hire somebody to cover up your weaknesses, right? So if you're not technical, <laughs> hire, hire a good technical person to focus in on, on, your, on, the, on that piece and you maximize your strengths. I fully agree with you. I'm not changing any firewall rules. So let's take this back to the personal personal side. side. We've We've gone all the way down down from mentors mentors to champions, to to good, to bad, to frameworks. frameworks. Tell me a little bit about what your daily routine is like. (laughs) It's, it's, I I would say it's not a routine. It's it's always something (laughs) different. Um, But look, my, the, the things that are very similar every day is I'm constantly reading, reading, you know, what are is sort of the news feeds that I get an email from different sources of, of threat intelligence information, keeping me up to date on what's the latest and greatest sort of uh, vulnerability. Although I, I might be a day behind or a few hours behind. I know Exchange is the latest one that I've been tracking lately, uh, but who knows what it is right now while we've been on this call um, because they change every minute. So it's, it's taking those Intel feeds, right? Reading the intelligence feeds that we get from, that I receive from external sources or from my own in- intelligence from my security operations team, um, taking cues for, for what's happening in the media. And, and I don't mean, I'm not gonna get into any of the political side of, of the media, but you know, if there's a cyber issue that's happening in the media, chances are one of my senior level executives has read about it, saw it, or somebody pinged them on it. So I try to take cues for, for what's hitting that sort of mainstream media around cybersecurity. So that way I can preempt that by making sure that we're sending advisories out uh, uh, to our senior level leadership. And then it's, uh, you know, depending upon the time of, of year, right? We're now in the NFL draft season. So I've got a lot of draft planning that's happening. Uh, we're planning a, as well for the next Super Bowl. Um, so those, those tent pole events are taking up a lot of my time and managing my team as a, as a, as a business, right? Where we, where we headed and how, how are we doing financially, uh, with, with staying, you know, either on budget or under budget, uh, more, more times than not on budget. Um, so that we don't, we're not getting in trouble with, uh, with my, with my leadership that I'm burning, we're burning too much cash. So it's not a regular routine. The only key regular items in that routine is constantly reading and staying in touch with what's going on in and across the industry. So we had a follow-up question to that is, what are the common references, uh, Uh, magazines, magazines, websites, news? What do you currently currently use for your sources of information or cyber information? Sure, so I'll I'll drop a few, but don't take this as an endorsement or or just take this as things that we subscribe to and and we essentially have uh, some sort of payment or or, or I I find interesting. So things like the register, right? BBC, um, I I read, the register I read, um, 
sometimes I read the onion if I want to get a quick little chuckle. <laughs> um, uh, the, uh, uh, we, I, I have uh, Gartner feeds. I have feeds from different threat intelligence services that, that we receive uh, on a daily basis. Uh, and then vendors. Vendors are usually pretty good, right? Because vendors want to sell me on a on a technology or service. They send me intel. They send me, you know, they keep me. I don't want to say they keep me up to date, but they keep me entertained with some of the new buzzwords that are coming down the pipe. Uh, but usually, those sources are, is what I'm actually uh, uh, reading. Uh, a lot of government agency sources. I'm a member of InfraGuard, so I read a lot of the InfraGuard stuff. Uh, CISA. FBI alerts, bulletins that come out. I read the, the DHS CISA uh, reports uh, almost religiously. Um, I'm flooded with so much that I actually do consume on a daily basis. But that, those are the typical sources that I that I have access to. It's um, learning every single day. And we have one last question, a little uh, tongue in cheek. Have you uh, met Tom Brady? <laughs> Tom Brady. Um, no, I have not met Tom Brady. Um, uh, I, I don't know why it's in here, but I thought it would be a great way to wrap up. I met, I've met Troy Vincent, if you know who that is. He was a former football player. He's actually one of, he's the head of our uh, football operations that reports to Roger Goodell. So I've met him, but no, I haven't met Tom Brady. I've, oh, seen, I him. Met Tom. <laughs> I've seen him play. I, th I think he did pretty well the last Super Bowl, you know, the, the yeah, one yeah. that we that. Yeah, it's behind you. Yeah. Tomas, I really want to thank you so much for taking the thank time to time speak, to speak with, with the, uh, the with the CSNP the and the community today. It has been a fascinating experience learning about your career and what makes what a good makes CISO. A good with that, I'm going to pass it back to Bob for closing Close remarks, remarks, and then we'll shut it down. And thank you, and a pleasure meeting you as well. Yeah, no, thank Tomas, you. Great. Thank you for the, the for the opportunity. Sorry, Bob. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you for joining us. You know, a couple of things I took away from this, really two things that, that stood out for me. Being humble. You have to be humble and constantly learning. And I think those are big takeaways for everybody here. So any other questions? Otherwise, um, I, I think we're going to go ahead and wrap this up. It's been a great experience. Tony, did you want to put the, uh, we have a little yeah. poll. We like some of the participants. Yeah, I'm going to I'm going to send a poll out really quick. It's a quick three questions. So if you could uh, fill that out, that would be greatly appreciated. If not, no harm, no foul. Um, but like I said, greatly appreciated. So um, thank you so much for everyone joining us this, us this evening. We understand you probably are, uh, you know, better off eating dinner, <laughs> watching TV, uh, whatever else that you do in your free time. But um, we do appreciate it. So thank you. Right. I'm just going to leave it up a little bit longer. And Bob, while the poll is still up, um, you want to just speak to how we're doing this? It's the second Thursday of every month, just yes, for everyone's every schedule? Thursday, every month. Uh, Last month was Maury, this month is Tomas. Next month, we're gonna have Olivia Rose, who is now the CISO, if I believe it's a business analytics company, Amplitude. Uh, the month that they, after that, we're gonna have Randall Freshi, who is the CISO of Denver Health. And then Maury, you wanna speak about the CISO we're gonna have in June from down under? We are, we have uh, Philip Mongo, uh, Zongo, excuse me. Um, he is a leader for a nonprofit organization in um, Australia. He also runs a uh, organization as a CISO there. Um, I've spoken with him many times in the past and his journey is one that you honestly just do not wanna miss uh, from growing up in Africa to becoming one of the uh, most well-known CISOs and authors in Australia for a financial organization. So. We have some really good CISOs coming up and we hope you will enjoy the series as we continue. Yeah, and the next one after that is gonna be, we think, I'll say it, but it's not confirmed yet, it's the CISO for United Airlines. Uh, and then we're gonna have, I think it's September, uh, Anahi Santiago, the CISO from Christiana Health, which is the largest healthcare in Delaware. I've been on a lot of calls with her. And so we have a great lineup uh, for, for the rest of the year. So I hope you will continue to join us. And we appreciate taking the time tonight. Thank you. Have a Thank good you night. Thank you all. Have a wonderful evening. Good night. Night, everyone.